Yeah, well, the, the thing that's interesting about the Sheikh's teaching is uh, there are certain fundamental principles that certainly helped me a lot. And one of them is the, the very interesting idea that um, neither the divine names come into manifestation, <coughs> nor do the essences, um, one without the other. So you, you have this, this, this divinity, this <coughs> essence beyond all need of the world, as it's described, but which then, then arrives at um, a level that Ibn Arabi likes to call lordship. And I think that he had, he had experienced the realities at such a level that it was bound to be frustrating and confusing and infuriating to anyone else. So as an example of this, um, in the chapter Saleh, um, he decides from his personal mystical experience to take the the well the well known command from God, um, be and it is. And whether it's similar to the Christian notion of an ex nihilo creation, meaning out of nothing comes the creation. For Ibn Arabi, this is just not true to his experience of things, which is that forever and ever um, there is a creativity that has to express itself at all different levels. And so his amazing um, advice that I take it as um, is that I shouldn't praise or blame anyone else for what happens to me. Because he says that, that in fact, he's reading it, because in, in Arabic, kun um, uh, if, you're, if you're being really strict with Arabic, you would say, he says, be, and then it, it is. See? It's not that be, and, and hence it is. It is rather be, and then it becomes of itself, of what it is. And this is this very challenging. And we have to remember that um, Ibn Taymiyyah, who I mentioned earlier, who is the source of a lot of the, the mischief that we see today among the Wahhabis and the, uh, the ISIS people and, and Al-Qaeda and so on, uh, he, he actually was most annoyed with Ibn Arabi on metaphysical grounds. I don't know if, you're, if, if you folks are aware of this. So he, he, he challenges this view very, very strongly. And, and the odd thing is that he doesn't, he's a smart man in many ways, but he's so infuriated he doesn't stop to read Ibn Arabi carefully enough because Ibn Arabi actually answers his very criticisms and questions of course, after his own death, because Ibn Taymiyyah lives a generation or two after the Sheikh's time, but also gives the most tremendous criticism, later quoted by Fassi and all of the, the critics that follow. Um, and they have to do something, see, your question is related to this, because there's this, this very strange um, uh, situation, like our teacher, um, there are a number of us here t today, um, uh, Mr. Zare, an Afghan teacher, and you, I'm sure you must know the, the famous um, uh, statement about Alast, or maybe you've heard of it, is, 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 am I not your Lord? And God says, you know, we caused the souls um, to, to give witness to the truth. And um, by asking them, uh, am I not your Lord? They said, uh, indeed, we, we witness that this is so. Well, clearly, since, since um, God is speaking in the Quran to the progeny, the unborn progeny, there, there must be some metaphysical situation where there does exist souls, nafs. See? Um, 
You see, so he's using the plural of word their selves. Alastubedavikum, kalu balo shahidno. They not only say we witness, but you would think the grammar is such that we witness. Not only do they witness that God um, is their Lord, but they seem to know that the ones next to them are witnessing that, because they say we witness this. You see, so so. But but our teacher said uh, this is because God is essentially speaking to Himself, and. Um, and that, and that there is only one essence, as the Sheikh, as I quoted the Sheikh today. So from the Sheikh's point of view, um, and again, we actually need to know the theological as well as the metaphysical argument today because of the mess we're in. You see, so we have to say, well, the people making the mess, they're claiming the following, um, they're, they're following the following ideology, which is actually based on the following metaphysics. So we do actually need to know a little bit about the metaphysics. And, and so when, when, um, so when God says, um, uh, um, we, we only, uh, we only have to say to a thing when we want it, be, and it is. So this is the, the Quranic line that he's quoting from. But um, just think about that for a minute. Um, who is he talking to? <clears throat> we only have to say to a thing when we want it, something that doesn't exist yet in this world. <clears throat> Be and it is. We obviously, on a, on a um, metaphysical and theological level, uh, God, who is, is all knowledge, would, would possess um, at one level, in eternus, the knowledge of <coughs> um, who he's speaking to. So what the Sheikh says is all that remains is the playing this out in the domain of the sensory world. At all the levels. At, at all levels in which God remains, as he says, um, elevated at all levels. Rafiul Darajat, so it's another principle of the Sheikh. Uh, I'm sorry? Uh, uh, he He's saying that, that divinity, even though, um, be like, even though the sun shines in a mud puddle, uh, this does not affect the elevation of the sun. It is still the sun shining at that level. <coughs> so it is, of course, always he. Um, but, but again, if you read Ibn Taymiyyah's criticism, he, he bases it, he, he, he builds his foundation out of Ibn Arabi's, what he regards as his faulty metaphysics. Whereas in fact, it's very easy theologically to, to disprove him. Now today, if you, if you, if you th these people is like Planet of the Apes, you know, it's very hard to talk metaphysics with people who are now working from militant ideology, for example, but coming back to, to your question, how, how, how am I related in this I way? I best not live in a puddle. Well, the, the other thing is that, is that um, oh, you know, I thought that I shouldn't be a mud puddle. But it turns out that he shines in a mud puddle. Yes. Uh, it's not okay to be a mud puddle. Well, that's not true. There are mud puddles all over the place. Um, and God's made sure that even the prophets have a little mud puddle in them. <laughs> so there's a wisdom in imperfection, in other words. And, and so Ibn Arabi tries to show us that there's no exceptions. Um, it's like I'm in a bad mood. It means that I'm not a spiritual person, not for Ibn Arabi. I'm in a bad mood, and this is a, a wonderful moment to understand the divine names. That's very free. And, and so, so this is so extremely useful and helpful yeah. to people who strive for perfection. Because I was saying uh, earlier to, to my Afghan friends who, who came in, and also to, to my friend Nick here, that um, the, the, the problem today with all transcendentalists is literally they don't appreciate the world. They're, they're reluctant, afraid, they don't respect the world. And, and, and Ibn Arabi has the most profound respect for the world because for him it is the Imago Dei and particularly the divine image and in the human being above all else, but, but even, even aside from the human being, all things are, 
uh, the embodiment of the divine name, so the world is sacred. So the world is, is either a, a smelly or, or, as in Christian theology and some Islamic theology, or the, the world is, is sacred. And so, so for him, the world is absolutely sacred, including um, when we have to remember when we see what is, is horrifying. We too must not become dualists. When we see suicide bombers or say, this is shocking, shocking. So the, the Sufi, uh, instead of saying, I, I seek refuge in God from the despicable Satan, the Ibn Arabi and those Sufis that say, I seek refuge in you, the mercy from you, the wrath. See, so, so, that, so there's a very different, uh, there's a different psychology, and therefore a different relationship, different language, different kind of intimacy. And all of this, um, a person is not afraid to be the mud puddle at the same time as the sunshine shining in the mud puddle. A person ends up knowing a lot more about themselves and about the relationship they have implied in your question. See? And, and so Ibn Arabi uh, explains that um, in, in, in his metaphysics and psychology, there's the 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 hayal mutasel and hayal mufasal. So uh, I would translate that as the <coughs> the the uh, imagination personally attached versus the autonomous imagination. <coughs> now the autonomous imagination is related to to the divine intellect. So that, so you could make the same uh, you could use the same logic. Well, what about intellect? What about what I think about being true or false? versus the idea of the divine intellect, which is, which is the, the source of everything, right? If you, if you follow that idea, you know, the atlikul and so on. So there's a pattern here, <clears throat> which is that I could um, become more receptive to the autonomous imagination. And uh, Ibn Arabi holds that myth, uh, in English we say, oh, that's a myth, we mean a lie. But for Ibn Arabi, uh, the capacity for vision and myth is the truest way to know God because it would lead to, to a profound, uh, deep awareness of awe of God's presence and it would bridge the eternal with the temporal. And, and the intellect of itself is not really capable of filling that out. The intellect is capable of intuiting that. But, so, we are the people of story. Everything is story. And the question is, how realistic, how much a part of the great story is the story I'm telling myself? And can I get closer to this, this greater myth that shows me, um, and I remember having a conversation with this, and I, and I was telling um, people in that conversation, there was a time years ago when I lived uh, <coughs> at Walker Creek Ranch, if you know where that is, and I would drive, I'd be driving home, and I would see a tree on the hillside, the single, the solitary oak tree on the hillside, and it was a very pleasant, symmetrical uh, hill. That, um, and I saw it through seasons, and the season that was most delightful was summer when the, the grass was golden and I would see the tree. And sometimes I would see it in the moonlight because I'd be coming home late. And there was always something about it. <clears throat> and I finally thought, you know, I think this tree is trying to tell me something. So I would stop <laughs> and I would look at this tree for a while. And I realized that the tree was essentially a prophet because it, there was something about, and the tree's still there, I still go see it, by the way. Um, I, I have I found other prophets as well in the meantime, but I still <laughs> value that prophet, uh, which is still there on this hillside. And the tree was, was saying something to me that was totally nonverbal. And all I can say, it was, it was telling me about unity and the purpose of life and the beauty of life and, and even about love. And so this, this tree was telling me these things at a level it was called a mythical, profound level in the human being that is transformed by myth. And especially if it taps into the autonomous 
story and imagination, which for Ibn Arabi is a, is a great domain, is a vast domain of learning. And furthermore, for him, <coughs> it's the domain between the, the, the sensible, uh, the, the completely sensible and physical, and, and the domain of this realm of ideas. Now you have the other Sufis, <coughs> the other great Sufis agree with him in, in this regard. Um, uh, Rumi, living just within a generation, you know, he says, uh, 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 he says, on hesi ke hatbar on hes mus haras nist hesi in jahan on di garas. So he says, that sense by which true reality can be known and experienced is not a sense of this world. It is a sense, but it's a sense from this other world, meaning it, there's, a, there's this domain where there's this other set of senses that he often compares to golden senses versus the copper senses of the body. Now for Ibn Arabi, all of them are valid. And even the person lost is, is on a, a caravan, is in a, is in a desert, maybe in a mirage. And, and um, I used to write, like to write a few poems that I, you know, there's a sub, this topic of Orientalism. And I thought, well, there could also be Orientalisms, which are like little poems in, in the Orientalist um, style. Uh, so let's see, how does it go? Uh, the yearning is a thirst to those of restless sleep. Um, well, I can't even remember this poem. Uh, know, my friend, that I have... Uh, Know, my friend, that I have found this world a desert of mirage, but the music of some veiled oasis is pulling tender sadness from my heart. The yearning is a thirst known to those of restless sleep. Memories of spirit fragrance blow a howling despair through empty dreams. You see, so this is a, this is a it, it, sort of the early sensations we may have of mysticism is that there's something going on. We know we're connecting to it, but it's very hazy, and then we get lost, and we find it again. You see, uh, know, my friend, that I have found this world a desert of mirage. So the desert is made out of mirage rather than the desert being in the, the breath of mirage being in the desert. Yet the music of some veiled oasis is pulling tender sadness from my heart. Is there something sad about the separation that Rumi talks about, you see? So, so in my mind, imagination uh, uh, he goes so far as to say <coughs> that he, he, he decides that all of these verses that are normally used against the, <coughs> the, um, the people who are deluded by imminence, uh, he decides to use it against the intellectual. So he says in, in the chapter um, Ilias, he says that Imagination and fancy is, is the greatest faculty, the most powerful faculty in the human being. And then he quotes the several verses um, where he says that God is above what they ascribe to him. And he says, meaning the intellectuals who make up stories about him that aren't true, about God that aren't true. My statement was meant to show how transcendentalists, um, uh, especially very, um, you know, people exaggerating transcendence, they typically do regard the world, and the world is so tempting that they actually uh, come up with, with astonishing pejoratives, um, really ugly pejoratives, so that they aren't tempted, in fact, to fall in love with it, which they should fall in love with the beauty of the world, you see. So if they're busy, if they're supposed to be. So if you read, especially the, the, the um, diaries of monks and so forth, and you'll see, of course, a great deal of that. You'll see a huge amount of that in any of the religious traditions. So it could be Buddhist, too, for that matter. Well, um, all right, we have, we have an astonishing thing uh, that has happened. The reason I opened uh, what you you, you, you missed out a little bit on was the, um, the situation today um, 
Uh, Trump uh, called, called certain people ma uh, spiritual materialists. I don't know if you know who Trump was. He was a Buddhist teacher. And, and you have um, the equivalent of, of the, the, the most spiritually material of the Muslims would be um, people who say that, well, you know, um, the Quran is, is literally true in every detail. And, and time doesn't change anything. So the model here, let's say that it is a pool of water, but it is static. Now, at the same time, when that school emerged, there were other schools that saw the revelation as a river. They saw that it was flowing. And, and they gave lots of evidence for that, evidence in the Quran. Just one example would be, slavery is allowed, but God really doesn't seem to like slavery. Because as we read in the Quran, we see, so apparently right now, it's permissible, but it's very clear from all the statements that he doesn't like slavery. Therefore, we have no reason to continue this institution, even though it was around in the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him. So what's happened is, with the, the failure of um, third world economies, third world states, um, with, with competing ideologies, the, the tolerant ideology that treasured the, the, the presence of the Jews and the Christians living in um, countries dominated by Muslims, those were, um, those were people who over centuries had seen, because not all of them did, the ones who gained power, they saw the religion as a river that, that stressed mercy and cooperation. And also, all we have to do is look at the Islamic expansion, where a great many people very quickly became the dhimmi class. So they paid taxes and they had protection. And then this led to all kinds of collaborations. You have other events, other fanatical events, called one like called the Inquisition. And very many of the Jews, hundreds of thousands of them, were invited into Turkey. The Turks aren't dumb. You know, they want, uh, the, the, the Sultan wanted a, a Jewish doctor and a Jewish dentist, you know, so, <laughs> and all of the science coming from Spain and everything. So there were huge numbers of them invited into a Muslim country. And I myself uh, took, took um, recording equipment uh, only, uh, only 10, 15 years ago to Istanbul to interview the Jewish community there to see how they felt. Now at that time, they were still quite delighted. I doubt that would be true now. Things have changed enough there, and I doubt they would be universally as happy there. Uh, we, we have to understand, uh, to get back, we, as, as, as Americans, need to better understand what has happened. And Muslims in particular, I think, need to understand and speak up and understand who has taken control and how they did it. What is their ideology? Uh, they are materialists. They are materialists is what they are. And their material is, uh, is a sofa called heaven. You see, they have no reason to like this world. And, and there's nothing in the Quran that would be changed today. So you wonder why they want modern weapons. You know, why don't they use swords? You see, they want the modern weapons, but they don't want... See, they don't want the stuff that they think conflicts with their materialist agenda for the sofa. But, so, so we have this, these, these actual materialists using the language of Islam, and meanwhile, the, the other end of the scale are the, the Sufis saw the Quran as, as a river that ran into an ocean that rose into the sky and rained upon the land. Sufis saw, saw, saw the Quran in a very, very different way. They, they saw it as the totality. And Ibn Arabi annoys the grammarians by saying that the Quran comes from Parana, to join, rather than to recite. So he says, you should become a Quran. Okay? You should join everything in yourself and become a Quran. Join transcendence and imminence and so on. It would be hard to get these people to accept the Sufi view. I think we can't really aim for that. But we can aim for what you were talking about, 
which is to, to uh, those of us who are older than, than 55 or something, we remember when everybody was going in Volkswagen vans through all of these countries and sleeping on the side of the road and getting invited into houses and having the best time of their lives through all these countries now where their throats would be cut. So, you know, it's a really different world. And it's absurd to think that this is a thing that Americans have to remember is, hey, wake up, you know, isn't there any historical memory here? This is a new thing in, 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 its, in its large scale manifestation. So it's like, a, it's like a bacterium that, given the right environment, it suddenly becomes truly infectious. And that's what has happened. It was there. It's not that it wasn't there. It's definitely in an interpretation of Islam that, that we, should, we should challenge and we should understand. So in order to challenge it, we have to understand it. That's what I'm trying to say. We have to understand the metaphysics and the theology and the history. So if we want the world to change, we have to know more. And we have to share more. We have to be willing to share and, and talk and, and question. Or we're going to have a, it's going to give rise to a fascist government in our own country. Fascism begets fascism. So, so to get back there, in, in all cases that we can do anything individually, we should do it. And when we can reach larger audiences, we should do it. Uh, and from both sides, we should do it. I deliberately started the talk with the notion of the Imago Dei. And in my talk, I spoke about its Jewish origins. <coughs> um, so you have the idea of Adam being created upon the divine image, meaning the human being. And, and this comes into Christianity and comes into Islam. This is the shared vision of <coughs> the spirituality of direct experience in all of those three traditions. And in Buddhism, they call it by different names and so forth. So we, we, should, we should emphasize that there's a very optimistic view of the human being that is, that is well outside of dogmatism and such. And, and I think that's where we could begin. Uh, and, and, but, but we do have to better understand these, the, the theology. And the, you can forget about the metaphysics, because these people are relying on the theology of people with um, mud pool metaphysics. They may not even know the metaphysics of the people whose theology they're relying on. And don't think Sufism will save us. Ibn Taymiyyah was a Sufi member of the Qadiri order. So when we read Hafez, he criticizes Sufis. That's who he's criticizing, the Sufis who became fanatics. They existed in his day. So we can't think, oh, they're Sufis, so they'll be fine. That's not true. So, so uh, that would be, be my, my hope, is that it will get back to this, this wonderful cooperation. And in these times, actually, individually, we find that, that that happens. We find that I'm in correspondence with lots of people in Israel and with lots of people from different parts of the world who see the talks I give or read stuff I've written, and they want to connect at this level that you're proposing is worth regaining. Huh? So Mumin, which we talked about in, the, in this, this, this talk, um, you see, um, like, like I, it, the reason I throw a little bit of, of numerology in is because Ibn Arabi is constantly using little bits of numerology. So for those who are, who are knowledgeable, they say, oh, I see, he's, he's doing sort of homage to Ibn Arabi's uh, sort of elucidation. So Ibn Arabi believes in numerology and believes it's in the Quran, and he believes he can use it in, in um, understanding things. So um, let's remember that um, if we go back to the hadith that I was quoting earlier, so, um, so God says, you know, la yes ani ardi wa la sama illa kena yes ani qab abdul mumin. So. So this, this yasani from, from, uh, from uh, wusa, the, the, this root, which means it, it has a capacity, uh, it has uh, the breadth, and it has the ability to hold, contain, you 
you see. So you have this, this root. It also means it's vast. So when we think about God's divine name, al al uh, the, the one who is vast. So now right away, you could see why a mystic um, would be drawn to this, the, the earth-shaking vastness and inclusion of um, uh, to see a world in a grain of sand and a heaven in a wildflower, old infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour. Well, who would say that? Why would somebody say that? They have to have some experience to say that. And, and what is that feeling? Um, in today's um, cosmology, uh, I argue that it's, it's um, if anything, better than traditional cosmology for describing mystical experience. So to discover a black hole in the, in the place of the heart, which has an event horizon, where there's everything, where how could, how could I possibly be holding this, coming back to this gentleman's question, huh? that's impossible. A finite creature, how could I possibly hold it? This is related to moment, because um, and I like to uh, often nab my friend Faisal John because his family name is Amin. So you have the the um, the prophet, peace be upon him, was called Al Amin, and another character is like Gabriel. And Faisal, remind me, what is the the numerology for Amin again? I forgot that. What It's one thirty-two. Huh? Yeah. So you have. You have the, the, the neurology of the heart. So you not only have, see, I only gave one little, uh, but actually Mumin is a very, uh, very important name because we also have Al Mumin Mirat Al Mumin. So it means the, the faithful is the mirror of the faithful. Now that's, that explains a lot of Sufism, especially like. Uh, Ibn Arabi's Sufism, but also the Mevlevis. Think about the Mevlevis. They, I'm not a Mevlevi, by the way, so it's okay for me, I think, to praise them in this way. So they, they'll, they'll do this turning stuff, and then you'll see them, and then they'll, they'll actually do the sajda towards each other sometimes. I'm not saying they all do that, but you know what I'm saying? That is like shocking um, blasphemy, right? You only should be doing the sajda towards God, but see, there's this idea that that all of the particles are related to each other and they're all related to the divine names. And so if you go to the conversation the Sheikh has about the divine names, they're all separate and distinct, but essentially they're all the, they're all the one. And then you come over to the human beings, they're all separate and distinct, and on the other hand, they're all one essence. See? So you have this idea of one essence and, and many parts at this level. And and Mumin is the gateway to to feeling that. See, so that's why when some of the ignorant Arabs converted and they say, we are now of the believers, they were told, don't say you're the believers, you're not the believers. Say that you, you've come into the religion. In other words, and that can only mean there must be more to the religion, more to being a believer than simply coming in and, and saying that you're Muslim. And, and if we go to this very profound level, uh, all of the commentators, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, al mumin, mirat al mumin. They say that the so this this is the, the the heart is the mirror of the heart. They say it's it's no secret that this was chosen because God says in Quran that He is that. He he calls Himself mumin, as you know, because huh? you're studying the divine names. And He says the human is also that. So you have this 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 reflectivity, different levels. And, and you're trying to, to feel that level. And, and uh, again, if I could give one other example of that gateway. Um, earlier I'm talking to my friends outside. and say, well, how's your life? And I say, oh, it's pretty difficult. You know, my mother is deteriorating. And for the first time, you know, I have to be cleaning her up after she has a big mess. And I have to do it all night. I have to do it several times. Um, I think I'm going to turn into a monster probably. Um, 
Well, no, that's not what happens. If you, if you turn to God, if you turn to the names and you start to feel the monster, meaning the reluctant one, the one reluctant to feel another person's difficulty, or the one who is ashamed, this is my mother, this is my mother's turn into this, this oh, God knows what, uh, and, you, and, you, and, you, and you suddenly, something exactly the opposite happens, and you find, uh, you find that none of it, of it means anything except the love. So you go towards the love and the mercy. Huh? So, so woman is a very important one of the divine names. Yes, he does. He does. Oh, okay. Yeah. And he says him. So, so he, he likes to use different pronouns. And, and if, is your question about that, about the <coughs> pronouns that he's using? So typically, um, we do see uh, important uh, metaphysical ideas in that. Generally speaking, we, we look at the the tense he's using. So don't forget that God also quotes. This is another interesting thing. People think it's all God's speech, but God will suddenly quote a prophet, and we'll know that because we'll go and look at what that prophet said, where God said that he said that. And then now he, God is saying it, so literalists say, well, God, no, God's saying that, because when God said it through the other prophet, it was actually him who was talking. But I think one of the important things about studying the Quran in that way is it should lead one not to be such a literalist. Because it, it, it really, it already is, um, it is such a running stream, a great river, that the very movement of it would make one uncomfortable imagining it as still water. And so there's going to be a lot of cognitive dissonance, and therefore there's going to be a lot of stories made up. Pseudoscience. Oh, how boring, you know, when you could have good science instead that also has some Islamic content. But the pronouns, um, uh, so when he says, for, for example, um, he, he even asks, you see, so he says, um, uh, so he'll say, he'll say, uh, um, So God says that, that he is the most merciful of any merciful ones, for example. But then in the case of uh, Jonah, uh, his, his uh, servant who turns away from him and who is, of course, taken in to the belly of the whale or the fish or whatever you want. Um, when, when Jonah re reaches the, 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 the deepest point of the dark night of his soul, um, he turns through inspiration, as is often the case uh, when God wants a servant to turn, and uses the personal um, pronoun, thou, you see. You see, so, so whether it's, it's thou art the most merciful of merciful ones, or um, many other cases um, where, uh, uh, where, where God refers to his creature or asks the creature to speak to him in the personal form. So again, if we think about the talk today is about uh, Tanzi and Tashbi, we really could divide a lot of the pronouns into those domains where we see where God often you see, where, when he says, uh, uh, he is with you wherever you are, um, uh, but then he'll say, uh, so he'll turn to, but I am closer, you see, to, to, than, to them than the jugular vein. So he'll use these different pronouns, and usually when he uses who or hua, it means, uh, uh, it means ipsity and it means his, 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 his fundamental identity. But for the Sheikh, his identity is the world also. So we have to remember uh, that at no time does the Sheikh become, uh, the, 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 the Sheikh 
is, is walking a delightful tightrope. He's a trapezist tightrope walker, and at no moment does he wish to stop fully in either transcendence or imminence. Mm -hmm. And as his balance is switching, they merge for a moment, and then he'll, he'll see the extreme of mm -hmm. imminence and transcendence. So he finds the, the, the resonance of that, you see, the, of these contraries, these seeming contraries, which are not contraries. They, they, they increase his understanding of God's intimacy, because God says that um, regarding intimacy, he says, um, um, oh, oh, you who believe, um, those of you who turn away from your religion, well, guess what? I will bring another people <coughs> that, that I love. You see, he says God will bring another people that he loves, and they will love him, you see. So this is a very famous saying in Quran, because the, the religious people, the literalists, they say, uh, no, God is too high. God's own words. He, he's saying, he's saying, he's, he's sad. Where, where are these fools? You know, what kind of stones have they become? I want somebody to talk to me, to be close to me. And if, if, they, if they don't do this, I'll bring a different people. He doesn't say, I'll crucify them, and roast them, and so forth. He says, I'll bring a different, <laughs> I'll bring a different people. So let's say that, that um, that in my case, again, how do we use the divine name? So if, if I realize, oh, I've, I've forgotten about God for this last hour or so, I was enjoying myself in this manner or that. Well, that was the divine names too. But I realized that, oh, you know, I can take advantage of this. Say, oh God, I believe I was an idolater for this last two hours. Uh, I wish to repent and be one of the ones that you say you will love them and, and be loved by them. So I'm, I'm quoting your lines uh, and invoking your verse because it is a sweet verse, and I, I'm cashing in on that verse. Please give me, uh, here's my ticket, please give me my reward. You see, meaning my reward is the intimacy implied in this verse. And of those other verses about burning in hell and all this, please, I wish to have nothing to do with that. So I only wish to have to do with your mercy, and I take refuge in your mercy. You see, so believe it or not, this kind of intimate conversation is what Sufism is about. Instead of, you know, it, it is also Gnosis, but and, and metaphysics, but that's not going to get you anywhere. You have to put gas in the car, too. So, so you, you, you so there's very much path of emotion, and his pronouns tell us something about his own feeling uh, for the world, humanity, etc. And, you know, my sense is one of a, of a wronged lover uh, who is sad because, um, you know, all the intimacy created, so little of it is felt. And he's also the stage master, so of course he's, um, you know, got his long-range story um, uh, with, with lots of twists and turns where eventually uh, everything comes, comes into his life, according, according to Quranic uh, doctrine. Huh? So, uh, is that it? Thank you, yes. Yeah, thank I you think, very much. I think we're at time. Thank you very much. Is, it's wonderful to be here. The Society is a wonderful organization. And the, the, if you look at their website, talk about an amazing resource if you want to know. It's, just, it's beyond belief, the, the material scholars and, and teachers of, of all kinds. But in particular, the really, the really um, uh, rock-solid scholarship about Islam about the history of Ibn Arabi's teachings in not just his own world, but in the far reaches of Asia and Europe, and the consequences of those teachings. So the, web, the Ibn Arabi website is, is truly an amazing resource, and, and so I recommend it to you.